The economic power of metropolitan areas, and thus the foundation of the metropolitan revolution, turns on innovation. And it turns out that innovation and density, which is the hallmark of cities and metros, are a perfect match for each other. And this brings me to the one of the exciting developments that we've seen on the ground in just the last few years, which is innovation districts. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, in Manchester, in Torino, in the Ruhr Valley, and in the industrial Midwest, and, and in parts of New England, we built industrial districts, characterized by a high concentration of industrial enterprises commonly engaging in similar or complementary work. In the mid and late 20th century, in Raleigh-Durham, in Silicon Valley, in suburban Washington, we built science and research parks and corporate campuses, which were spatially isolated, accessible only by car, and these places put little emphasis on interaction or placemaking amenities. So innovation districts are in effect the successor to these purpose-built zones. It's a, this is a relatively new term, innovation district. I know you guys have been talking about your knowledge district for a little while, so <clears throat> you were on the cutting edge there. Uh, just a handful of places have started to use this term to describe a concentration of innovative institutions and resources that together are creating a kind of more than the sum of their parts effect. Proximity matters so much for idea generation, and we really got away from that. Universities, right, like Brown, like RISD, always understood that idea, right? That's why they drew bright people to campuses, and they put them together, not just in classrooms, but in student unions, in all of these other, you know, in quads, in all of these sort of interstitial places where people could meet, connect, you know, invent Facebook in their dorm room, that kind of thing. Somehow we decided, though, that when people turn 22, 23, 27, uh, you know, depending on their, their tenure at the university, that they became totally different and they could create ideas in these sterile boxes or in cubicles. And we're realizing that's just not true. Innovation districts are starting to appear in the United States around universities, like Kendall Square near MIT, near University City, which complements Penn and Drexel, and in downtown Atlanta in the area near Georgia Tech. We're also seeing a model of innovation districts coming around unused waterfronts. So that's happening in Boston, in Seattle, and at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We're also seeing science parks, the epitome, right, of this mid-20th century isolated form of innovation, reinventing themselves. So Research Triangle Park is undergoing a big master plan overhaul so that it will become a more collaborative, connective, urban-like space and attract younger workers and innovative firms. Even Detroit has a nascent innovation district. Now, when most people see Detroit, what they look at is what's not there. They only see what's missing, right? They see the vacant land. They see the abandoned buildings. They see the eerie emptiness of a city that was once home to 1.8 million people and now holds less than 700,000. But Detroit does have density and innovative economic activity concentrated in two neighborhoods, downtown and midtown. About 37% of the jobs in the city of Detroit are in these neighborhoods, which take up only 3% of the city's land. An entrepreneur who grew up in one of Detroit's suburbs has invested $1 billion, that's with a B, $1 billion in downtown office buildings. Approximately 10,000 new jobs have come to downtown in the last two years. People on the ground suggest that the biggest surge in jobs has been in the last year or so, again, indicating that this area is gaining momentum. From 2009 to 2011, the city as a whole lost jobs, but Midtown and Downtown saw a 5% jump in jobs. Thousands of new workers are now downtown from companies that relocated from the suburbs. All of this was happening as the city was on the precipice of bankruptcy. And now that bankruptcy has actually happened, a lot of the leaders in Midtown and Downtown say that they think it represents a fresh start for the city. So these people weren't necessarily surprised by the bankruptcy. They were not going in uh, you know, imagining some magic turnaround. They knew how tough things were in the rest of the city. They still believed that Midtown and Downtown were worthy investments. So the innovation institutions that are in Midtown and Downtown include hospitals, businesses, higher education and design centers, business incubators, clusters of technology and creative firms, plus resources and entrepreneur, 
uh, in resor resources for entrepreneurs and new businesses. The new M1 rail line will soon link downtown and midtown and could serve as kind of a circulatory system for this emerging innovation district. The density of these innovative institutions and companies leads to new businesses, new products, new export opportunities, and new jobs. Over time, this economic activity and the new apartment buildings and retail strips that it draws will spread over into surrounding neighborhoods. And over time, people from surrounding neighborhoods can send their children to STEM-focused schools, including one that's located in the College for Creative Studies, with close ties to businesses in the area and a tight system of internships and certifications that support a school-to-work transition. This is how the Detroit economy could, slowly but surely, regain, trans, uh, regain traction. So the places that we highlight in our book, right, ranging from New York and LA, right, clear economic powerhouses, to Houston, a very fast-paced, constantly renewing itself economy, but also including places like Detroit and Northeast Ohio, are meant to suggest that the metropolitan revolution can take root anywhere. Right? There's no place that's too small to benefit from it. There's no place that's too large to need it.